talk about is um, almost give you a case study. We put data very similar to this. We actually use CRGs in our risk stratification uh, methodology and explain you know, how we did what Paul described. How did we sort of use this risk stratification as a tool for sending specific patients to different <coughs> care management strategies, whether it's going to a special new clinic or you know, accessing a clinical pharmacist that we've recently added to our staff at a regular primary care clinic. So again, the impetus for this won't surprise this group. Um, everyone's interested these days in, in identifying high-risk patients, um, in particular the ACO movement and the medical home movement. Um, federally, spurred by healthcare reform in our state, created RICOs, um, these, these literatures. What we're trying to do is you know, we, as Paul said, we have, we have our own health plan, so we've been identifying patients for a long time for the purposes of care management. And what sort of plan-based approaches are good at doing is doing the kinds of things you saw from TRIO, using administrative data to identify patients. What sometimes doesn't work as well in a remote um, kind of environment is reaching out to individual patients and sometimes having that outreach happen at the primary care practice works better. So we're trying to blend the strengths of both approaches in this project. Um, and what we need to do is sort of bring both um, skill sets together. And so I'll talk a little bit about that as, as I describe our risk stratification model. So as Paul said, you know, the, the goal of the project is really to sort our patients into four risk, um, risk strata so that we can say, you know, here are the resources that we want to enhance the medical homes with when we're talking about a tier one patient. Here are the resources we want to match to the patient who's in tier four. So it's really important to try to figure out who belongs in which tier because it has, it's essentially an eligibility for an enhanced service. Um, what our major building block was for our four tiers was CRGs. So we're using exactly the tool that you have access to. And, you know, I'm going to describe what we did to layer on top of CRGs, but you could do a lot of what we did just with the CRG information. That's how 90% of our patients get put into a tier. Um, what we did on top of CRGs was we, we tried to leverage some of the data assets we have at Denver Health. We have um, real-time information on people's utilization. So if someone hits the ED within our health system, if someone hits the urgent care or hits inpatient, we know about that in a real-time basis. And so sometimes what we did was we took someone who was lower risk according to the historical utilization and bumped them a tier and then sent a message out to the front lines to say, you know, you should really take a look at this person. Um, so utilization was sort of a, a criteria we used to kind of um, promote people to a higher tier. Um, we also had some existing work thinking about high-risk populations. We had a number of different registries, in particular our Children's Special Health Care Needs Registry. And so we leveraged that work that we had done in the past to figure out where people should go uh, within tiers. Um, we did experiment with using diabetes and hypertension registries early on, and we actually kind of abandoned that because they're too, um, it creates too much movement between tiers. We use that as a trigger to, for action, but we don't actually do a, a tier assignment because people move in and out of control a lot and it just created a lot of movement between tiers. So mechanically what we did um, is we, we actually dove down into some of the details. So, you know, you might remember from the pre previous presentation, you know, CRG status nine is your, catastro is your yeah, catastrophic category. And if you drill down, you find out there's individual, you know, diagnostic groups that, that build into that catastrophic category. Cystic fibrosis, span, spina, spina bifida, HIV disease. And what we did is we sort of said, you know, we don't necessarily want to put all of status nine into a single tier. We might want to look at these individual things. And again, you don't have to do that, but we chose to do that. And the reason we chose to do that is because we felt that some um, of these categories might not be actionable. They might be expensive, but there wasn't too much we could do with the care coordination, care management strategy. Um, so we didn't want to like fill our tier four with people that we really didn't feel like we could work on. And so we kind of moved them you know, to a lower tier because really what our purpose was was to, to allocate a care management resource, care coordination resource. So here's how they, they cross map. So again, you would have access to this information on the column. The one through nine is CRG information. And you can see that there's generally alignment in that if there's a higher CRG, generally speaking, they ended up in a higher tier. 
The differences really have to do with the kinds of things I described. Their utilization ended up bumping them up a tier, or we just decided this kind of person isn't really very actionable, so we're going to bump them down. Um, so you'll have a panel in a minute that talks a lot about how we use this um, information on the front lines. I'm going to give you two other ways that we can use this information. Um, if you're, I know we have a mixture of big groups and small groups, but if you're in a, a big group kind of system, what was useful for us was to sort of say, you know, how, how do our high-risk populations distribute across our multiple clinic sites? You know, is that, you know, so we can figure out where to concentrate our enhanced staffing resources. So this was a quick way where we can kind of say, where, where do our high-risk patients fall out? So that was like an administrative use of this information. Next slide. Um, here's a detail slide at, at, at a patient level that can be used kind of two different ways. You can do it to sort of like decide, is this someone I really want to, to work on specifically for care management purposes? Our team, the evaluation team, is really interested in you know, the, the change in spending pattern over time and the tier changes over time because we're really interested in how the whole population moves. If you go to the next slide, um, here's our tier four pediatric population and they're quite stable over time. If you see the blue group is the group that kind of remains in tier four even as we rerun the algorithm. If we did the same slide for adults, you'd see a lot more movement. According to how we've currently identified um, adult tier four, people move in and out of the tier really frequently. And that just has implications for your program. If you're designing a program that assumes constant contact or, or longitudinal contact with patients over time, and people are moving in and out of your high-risk group, it, it just has some design implications. So that's, again, it's sort of more of an administrative use of this information. Um, we don't believe that we've perfected this. We're actually very interested in a conversation with you all about your ideas for how you've done some of this kind of work. When we first submitted the grant, we used only financial criteria. And when we fed it out to our clinicians, they said, you know, these aren't the right patients. These, you know, end-stage renal disease, Terminal cancer, very expensive. Um, you know, I don't know what you want me to do in a quick care coordination sense to modify that spend. Um, so a lot of our subsequent work in this area has really been to engage the clinicians about identifying who are high opportunity patients, who has avoidable utilization. And this is something that was a centerpiece of our innovation grant. We said on the front, like, we're going to innovate around this, and it's where still a lot of work is being done. Um, again, just to review, the, the ways we've used um, risk tiers are we use it on the front lines, as you're about to hear in some detail, about sending lists of patients out to individual medical home-based providers to do something with. We use it to allocate staff across our clinics, you know, based on where the, the high needs are. Um, we're using it to kind of cross-validate other identification methodologies. Maybe Simon will hit on this, I don't know. but. You know, again, we had a pre-existing children with special health care needs, and we had CRGs, and sometimes they identified the same high-risk patients, and sometimes they didn't. So we've been looking at that Venn diagram and saying, you know, what can we learn about these two methods? And we, we uncovered some kids we really just didn't know about, and we weren't, um, you know, on the on the radar. Um, it's very it's been very useful, say, in the context of healthcare reform, describing our population. You know, we've been looking at our uninsured by risk tier to figure out, okay, who's likely to come to Denver Health? What is their risk profile going to look like? What do we need to do as a health system to gear up and be ready for um, some pent up demand potentially? And then a couple of researchers have used it as just a quick and dirty way to get a sense of, um, am I going to have enough sample here to do whatever study I want?